Okay, welcome back. We can start uh, the course on uh, Cosmic Microwave Background, and we have uh, Raphael Flauger. Okay, everyone can hear me? Yeah. So, thanks so much for the, for the invitation. Uh, I was here as a student twice, but never for the cosmology school. I was here for two of the string theory schools, but I really enjoyed my, my time in Trieste, and I hope everyone's having, uh, having fun. So uh, I was asked to talk about the, the cosmic microwave background. I feel a little bit bad because at least today I'll only have slides. I don't have a, a nice blackboard talk like Enrico did. I'll eventually try to do some of the things on the blackboard. But at least today uh, and also in the beginning uh, tomorrow, there will be a lot of little uh, images and it'll mostly be about the, the history of the CMB. So it's probably better if I show them on the slides over drawing you some, some sketches. So the outline for today, the beginning is very basic. I'll just give some uh, short review of general relativity and I call it part one because it's just the, the homogeneous universe that I'm uh, using. And then I'll talk in some detail about the prediction or why there was an expectation that there should be a cosmic microwave background to be discovered. And then I'll talk about the, the measurement and uh, about the, the history of the measurement. And eventually I'll talk about the, the spectrum, the black body spectrum and deviations from the black body spectrum that you might hope to, to measure at some point. Um, and then tomorrow I'll finally talk uh, more about the, the fluctuations that Enrico already talked about. But tomorrow, today will be essentially just the homogeneous universe. And so this will also be the the beginning, and I wasn't, I mean, I did look through the slides and I, I realized that you've seen a lot of these uh, things already, um, but so I just wanted to make sure everyone's really on the same page, so I'll uh, start really from the beginning just by showing you the original heading from, from Einstein's, uh, Einstein's paper from, from 1915, and I think everyone knows that the, the basic idea uh, behind general relativity is really that you should no longer, as in the Newtonian theory, think of gravity as some dis uh, force that's acting on two bodies at a, a distance, but you should think of gravity as arising because space-time is curved, and uh, the curvature of space-time arises uh, through, uh, as a consequence of the matter distribution. So this is what I'm showing here in this little little sketch. I'm also a little bit embarrassed by my drawings, given that we had the fancy animations in the, in the previous talk on gravitational waves, so this will be uh, a theorist's kind of attempt at uh, visualization. And uh, yeah, so this is the usual um, thing you've al uh, always seen. So the, the basic question uh, that I saw in some of the slides was also already covered. The first question you might ask is, well, how do you encode the geometry of the uh, space? And really, in principle, there's different ways of approaching this, but everyone in, in cosmology uh, is following, everyone in, in physics for the most part, is following uh, what Riemann taught us in 1854 in his Habilitation. Uh, this is like a, um, another version of a, a PhD thesis, and this is where Riemann developed what we now call Riemannian geometry. And the idea there is that the geometry of space-time is encoded in a, in a line element, which already in, in his work was denoted in this way, so we're using the, the same notation. And then the, what the line element is supposed to encode is the uh, distance between two nearby space-time points. So this is a somewhat pedestrian definition, but it's good enough for our purposes. And so the, the idea is that if you have a point with coordinates x and y, and you have another point with coordinates x plus dx, and y plus dy, then in flat space, you know that the distance between them is given by Pythagoras, so the distance between them is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared, or ds squared, so the line element of flat space is just dx squared plus dy squared. For the, for the two sphere, uh, it, it's some, uh, somewhat more interesting, so now you might be interested in the distance between a point with coordinates uh, theta and phi, so theta is uh, this angle here, and then phi is the, the angle uh, around here. And uh, if you're interested in the, the distance between a point with coordinates theta and phi, and theta plus d theta and phi plus d phi, uh, then you know that the ds squared is sine squared theta d phi squared plus d theta squared. So these are the, the basic 
the, the simplest spaces you can think, uh, think about. You can also look at uh, various other spaces. I'm sure you've seen the, the Schwarzschild metric and, and so on. And so uh, for these are the uh, for spaces, I mean, with uh, all positive uh, signature, in general relativity, the only difference is that we now also have a time, and in the uh, Minkowski version, you know that the line element is just minus dt squared plus dx squared. I won't really go into detail because I'm assuming everyone has seen this and has taken some course on special relativity. If that's not true, then you can just ask uh, me or anyone else uh, later. And so here what's new or what isn't the case in the Euclidean or the Riemannian geometry is that there are points that have uh, uh, that are null separated. So there's points that you can reach from x by sending out uh, light that have uh, ds squared equal to, to zero. For cosmology, what's nice is that we're really only interested in very simple geometry. So at a given time slice, our universe schematically looks something like this. So there's a bunch of, uh, of galaxies. So these are supposed to be typical co-moving galaxies. And then you can measure the, the typical size between these galaxies. I'll call that A1, and then you can uh, lay, make a, a grid. So you could have 0, 1, 2, and so on. And then the distance between this one, between these two points, is just, uh, again, dx squared plus dy squared times the, the typical distance between these co-moving galaxies. And you might want to look at the, um, at the same picture at some later time. So we know from, from Hubble that the universe is expanding, you might uh, look at a later time. So then the only thing that has really changed is the, uh, the physical uh, distance or the typical distance between these co-moving galaxies. And so you know that the, the line element in, in uh, general relativity for the flat uh, FLRW universe is, is of this form, and it just describes the, the galaxies flying apart. So this is the basics that I think everyone is uh, familiar with. Um, more generally, uh, the universe doesn't necessarily have to be uh, flat. So in principle, even if you assume that it's uh, isotropic or maximally symmetric, the, the slices, you can allow for the universe to be either closed, so it's a, a closed three-sphere, uh, three uh, or it could be open, so you have a hyperbolic three-space or it's, it's flat, this is what we saw. And Enrico already uh, mentioned, and you've heard it many times, that all data uh, points us to a flat universe. So the universe is flat to, to very good approximation, and so I'll restrict to the, to the flat FRW metric. Now, this means really that the, the geometry in our universe is encoded by the, the scale factor uh, A of t, and it, you also saw in the metric that a, a rescaling of the scale factor is unphysical. It's just a re, uh, change of your coordinates. So the, the physical quantities, uh, at least in a spatially flat universe, should really be independent of the normalization of the scale factor. And so there's typically you introduce either the ratio of scale factors at different times. So for example, the, the scale factor at some time t divided by the scale factor at the present. And we'll see in a little while uh, why I'm calling this the, the redshift. But this, this quantity is usually also called 1 over 1 plus z. And then for the, uh, the other interesting quantity you can look at is the, the fractional rate of change of the scale factor, which is the, the Hubble rate or expansion rate of our universe. So these things I'm, I'm sure are familiar to everyone. Um, the, the relation between the, the matter content and the geometry is given in terms of the Einstein equations or Einstein field equations. You saw them also in uh, Enrico's talk. And so on the left, you have a geometric quantity. So you have the, the Ricci scalar, which is constructed from the Christoffel symbol. So you start with some metrics, some geometry. You can compute the, the Christoffel symbols, compute the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar, which is the trace of the Ricci tensor. And then this, uh, this quantity is supposed to be 
uh, determined by the, the matter distribution that you have. The cosmological constant, you can either think about as a cosmological constant like I'm doing here, or you can move it to the other side and think of it as, as vacuum energy. It's really up to you. The reason this combination appears is because you want the matter density or the stress tensor for the matter to be covariantly conserved. And this is a, a quantity that's covariantly conserved. In fact, if you look at some of the old papers, there were papers or attempts to use not the Einstein tensor, but to use just the uh, Ricci tensor, and then uh, you run into, into contradictions. So this is what fixes uh, this combination. And uh, also, Enrico pointed this out already, they can be obtained from the Einstein-Hilbert action from a, a variational uh, principle. So um, I'm, as, I don't know how to, how to ask, but it, so ha, has anyone not seen these pieces just to, to gauge some idea or has everyone seen them? Could, could you maybe raise your hand if, you have, if you've derived the field equations from this action at some point? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, just as an aside, so uh, it's not something I, I want to show, and it's also not relevant, but if you start with a, a theory in, in flat space, let's say with a massless spin two particle, then you can convince yourself that at, at low energies, the, 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 the action describing uh, the system will always be of this form. So this is the, the unique action to some extent for interactions between massless spin two particles and matter up to higher derivative corrections, which are negligible at long distances. So they're certainly completely negligible in cosmology because the, the scales that appear uh, in, in the higher dimensional operators, you would write are some microscopic scales. They might be the string scale or the Planck scale, some higher dimensional, uh, some, some scale that suppresses them. And the typical curvature is in cosmology of order of the Hubble scale. So these are suppressed by Hubble over M-string uh, or M-Planck to some power. This is true at late times. In what Enrico is talking about, it's not entirely true, so you might be potentially interested in, in some of these corrections. But for the talk today, I'll be interested in times from nucleosynthesis to the present, roughly. And so there, you really don't have to, to worry about these kind of uh, corrections. And this is really the unique uh, action. And then you can just evaluate it for the, for the metric that we have and uh, work out what the equations of motion are. So the zero, zero component just gives you what we call the, the Friedman equation. So it's h squared is eight pi g over three times rho. And then the ij, the spatial part of the uh, Einstein tensor or the field equations gives you an equation that looks like this. It's three h squared plus two h dot is minus eight pi g times the, the pressure. Typically we use this one and then instead of using this one, we're converting uh, these two equations into the Friedman equation and the uh, energy conservation. Um, so this is easy to see. You just take another time derivative of this equation that you get 2h h dot is equal 8 pi g times rho dot. And then you can uh, just uh, uh, get rid of the, the h dot in this equation. You get a continuity equation. And if you assume an equation of state of this form, so this is by no means uh, the most generic equation of state, but it's something that naturally arises if you have uh, pressureless dust, meaning non-relativistic particles, or if you have uh, radiation, in which case it's, it's one third, then you get an energy density from this uh, conservation law that redshifts like uh, one over A to the three to the uh, one plus W. So this is, uh, the, um, if you have a, a more interesting situation, so we have a, a not just one component, but you have, let's say, some, some matter with P equals zero, some radiation with W equals uh, one third, and then a cosmological constant with W equals minus one, then the Friedman equation looks like this, and the energy density is just uh, redshift like one over A cubed for the, for the matter, one over A to the four, because the wavelength of the photons is also redshifting, and then it's constant for the, for the cosmological constant. Now, one thing that we'll still need, or I said I would show you why we call it the, the redshift, is 
uh, the mo how do particles move in, in this background. So you just have a probe particle now. You're not back reacting or taking the back reaction of this into account. You just really are interested in some, some electrons or some protons, some gas of, of photons. Of, uh, and so the action of these point particles uh, is described uh, by the, the, the world line action, which just measures the invariant length of the, uh, uh, of the, the curve you're drawing. And if you vary this, uh, you find the geodesic equation. So these particles move along geodesics. And in the FLRW metric, you find that it looks uh, like this. So it's easy to work out. Um, I could ask again if everyone's derived it, but maybe I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll save it for now. If you haven't derived it, you should do it as an exercise. If you've derived it, that's good. And you find that the... Uh, momenta redshift, uh, well, the dx i by d tau redshifts like 1 over a squared. And so if you're looking at the momentum of a particle, which for a massive particle is defined in this way, then you see that you get a factor of a squared from the spatial part of the metric, and then you get 1 over a to the 4 from this. So you get a, a 1 over a squared under the square root, or you find that the momenta of particles uh, redshift like uh, 1 over a. Here I'm specifically looking at massive particles because the, the world line action for the massless ones is a little bit more complicated, but it's easy to, to generalize, and it remains true for the massless particles. So the momenta as the, the universe expands uh, decrease. In particular, they decrease like 1 over, uh, 1 over a. So if you look at the momentum of a particle today, then you find that it's the, the, particle, the momentum of the particle at the time it was produced times this uh, redshift factor. So if it was produced at some, some early time, then we observe it uh, with a momentum that's less than 1 over 1 plus z than the momentum which, uh, with which it was produced. So this is why I call this the, the redshift factor. So the momenta of these quanta just redshift, and this is also what explains the 1 over a to the 4 for radiation. So you just have an extra 1 over a uh, in, the, in the redshift, uh, in the uh, relation between the energy density and the, the scale factor. So this was the lightning review of uh, general relativity. And hopefully you've seen all this before. Um, if not, uh, you can ask uh, uh, around. Um, now what I want to do is uh, talk in, in some, uh, some detail about why there was an expectation that we should see a cosmic microwave background or some, some bath of uh, radiation. And so you should, to some extent, forget what people uh, told you in the earlier lectures and imagine that you don't know anything about uh, cosmology and uh, try to go through in the same way that people at the time discovered that there should be this uh, bath of uh, hot radiation. And so what people were studying at the time was the question, what is the origin of, of chemical elements and how do we explain their, their, uh, their origin? And at the time, there was an idea that somehow there should be some uh, equilibrium state during which these, uh, these um, heavy elements are produced. Um, but it was in, in 1946 that Gamow pointed out that if you extrapolate the expansion rate of the universe backwards to the energy density that you need to produce these uh, heavy elements, uh, the universe is actually expanding very rapidly. So this is just taking the equations uh, we had on the, on the previous slide, extrapolating them backwards to the energy density to, uh, you need for, for these nuclear reactions. And then he writes that the conditions necessary for rapid nuclear reactions were existing only very, for a very short time, so that it may be quite dangerous to speak about an equilibrium state which must have been established during this period. So he's saying it's really unclear that there was an equilibrium state and maybe you should think about it as a, a non-equilibrium process. Uh, and this is what uh, Alpha, Bede, and Gamow uh, studied in their famous uh, 1948 paper. So here the idea was that all the, the heavy elements were formed by neutron capture. So the idea was that you start with a universe that's filled uh, entirely of, of neutrons um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why this was the, the assumption people made, but somehow the int intuition was that the early universe is somewhat like a neutron star, so the pressures are so large 
that somehow the electrons get pushed into the nucleus. This is at least what they write into the paper. We now know there's weak interactions and eventually they uh, also figured that out. But they had the assumption that the universe started entirely filled with neutrons. Some of them decay, you get protons. Some of the neutrons get captured on the protons. You form deuterium, you capture an additional neutron and so on. And the idea was that you really form all the, all the elements in this way by capturing one neutron at a time. So you have uh, the rate of change of the abundance of the ith. So i here runs over the atomic number. So this is the, the ith uh, element. Uh, is the rate of change in it is uh, some proportionality uh, factor with uh, scale factors and so on but it's given by the cross-section for neutron capture times the number density for the nucleus with atomic number I minus one, and then minus the, the rate at which the, the ith nucleus decays. So this is the, the system of equations they studied in their paper. And around that time, uh, there were measurements of uh, neutron cross-sections of MeV uh, neutrons, and they used these uh, measurements of the cross-sections and with the, with the cross-sections, you can then you can solve this system of equations and you can compute uh, this quantity. So it's something like the neutron number density integrated over the, the time of the, the process took place. And this is really the only, uh, only free parameter in, this, uh, in the system with the initial conditions where you start with all neutrons, all the other nuclei are zero, so then the only thing you really need to know is essentially how many of these uh, neutrons you had. Equivalently, instead of uh, the, the number density, you can write it in terms of the energy density by relating the energy density to the number density by multiplying by the mass. And so what you can do is you can compute this quantity and adjust it to fit the abundances of the heavy elements. So this is what they were doing in the paper. So there's, these were the, the measurements that came out around the time. And then there was a, a fit uh, from the, the equations I showed you. So they, they run them and then they fit them. Obviously now we can do this in five minutes in, or maybe less in, in Mathematica. At the time it was substantially more difficult to, uh, to do these kind of things. Um, uh, it turned out, so we'll talk about this more. I mean, there's a number of issues uh, in, in doing this. Uh, one thing was that in the paper, uh, there was a, a numerical mistake. So the number they actually quote in the paper is off by some 10 orders of magnitude. The second one is, uh, that we'll discuss in more detail, is that at the time they were fitting to the abundances of heavy elements. We now know they didn't really form in this way, and we'll explain why they didn't form uh, in this way. So Alpha eventually corrected the numerical mistake, so I don't quote the, the wrong numbers, but once you do this exercise, you do it correctly, self-consistently, you find a number uh, that is something like 10 to the 18 uh, seconds per cubic centimeter, and what you can do with it is uh, you can... Um, Try So you can compute the number of, of neutrons. On the one hand, you know that we started with a universe that's uh, currently only filled with, with matter. So you have a matter-dominated universe, which means you have a, 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 an energy density that goes like 1 over 6 pi g times t squared. And the energy density here is the energy density in, let's say, uh, protons and neutrons. The number density of neutrons, you have an additional factor because they decay. And so you can integrate uh, this equation and you can estimate from the value that you need the time at which nuclear synthesis should start uh, for this process, assuming that the process takes about the same or is of order, the duration is of order, the, the neutron lifetime. If you do this estimate, you find that the, the start time for nuclear synthesis is about 10 to the 4 seconds. And this is, uh, is problematic. Um, maybe I can ask why it's problematic. It's kind of on the slide, so it's not too well organized. But <laughs> so the, the problem is that the, the neutron lifetime is around 880 seconds. And so in this uh, type of cosmology, uh, you would have all the neutrons decay. So in other words, the universe would be filled entirely with, uh, with hydrogen, which is a universe that we just don't live in. And so Alpha at this point uh, points out uh, 
that uh, a universe in which you have uh, hot uh, radiation around, not just hot uh, neutrons, actually provides a way out because the universe is expanding more rapidly. The nucleosynthesis starts earlier and it starts at a time when you still have neutrons around and you can pr uh, generate the, the heavy elements. So this was the uh, one of the reasons that people thought that there should be this radiation around. Uh, one of the problems, as I said, with these elements was that there is a gap at atomic number 5 and 8, so there's no stable nuclei with atomic number 5 and 8, and so you cannot really generate all the, the heavy elements in this way. Uh, you cannot cross these barriers. Alpha somehow never gave up on, on this idea, and he always thought that this would uh, somehow, uh, somehow happen. Um, there were lots of papers written about trying to increase the, the densities, so you have uh, three-body interactions, which we know happen in, in stars and so on, but in the early universe, this just doesn't happen. So the, the first paper that in some sense was on the, on the right track in the, uh, was a paper in, in 1948 by Gamma, which points out that, well, before the, the heavy elements form, you certainly have to form deuterium along the way. So you first want to uh, capture uh, a neutron on a, on a proton to form a deuterium. Before this happens, nucleosynthesis certainly cannot happen. So then the question is, when do you start forming deuterium? And the estimate in this case, I mean, you, you estimate the, the rate of uh, neutron capture on protons and you want this rate to be comparable to the, to the Hubble rate. If you, if you capture too few of them, then you will not, uh, you will not form deuterium. So you can do this, uh, this estimate. Hubble goes like 1 over t. So you can rewrite this equation and estimate this number again. This is the analog of the integral we had before. And what was known at the time were the, the nuclear cross-sections for uh, neutron capture on, on hydrogen and also the, the typical velocities, and you get an estimate of this order of magnitude. So this is again in a universe still that's only filled with, with matter, but it's at least uh, an estimate that conceptually makes sense. It's no longer an estimate based on fitting to the heavy elements, which were not produced in, in this way, but it's just an, est an estimate based on when deuterium actually has a chance to form. And again, if you're in a matter-dominated universe, uh, deuterium would form at times later than 10 to the 4 seconds, again, at a time much la uh, later than or uh, longer than the neutron lifetime, and so you just would end up also in this uh, scenario in a, in a universe filled only with uh, hydrogen. So, based on this, uh, you might think, okay, so maybe there was this uh, black body radiation around at early times. From the, the current point of view, maybe it's difficult to understand why there wouldn't have been uh, hot, uh, hot radiation around at the time because there's plenty of interactions that actually produce photons and so on, but at the time it, it took some iterations to come to, to that conclusion. And at the time, uh, based on these ideas, they gave, they uh, concluded that there had to be this black body radiation and also estimated the temperature and concluded that today there should be black body radiation with a temperature of around 5 Kelvin around. And this very close, I mean, obviously we now know that there's black body radiation with 2.7255. Uh, a Kelvin around from various various CMB experiments, um, but so some of the uh, estimates still were not entirely self consistent. I mean, once you now add this hot radiation, uh, it doesn't so much matter when you first form the deuterium. You want to understand when you first have an appreciable uh, number density of of deuterium, and at least at early times, if you have a lot of radiation around the radiation will disintegrate the deuterium as soon as it forms and you're mostly still in a, a system where you have uh, protons and neutrons. So the beginning of nucleosynthesis is really when photodissociation becomes too inefficient uh, for, uh, for the deuterium to be uh, destroyed. And uh, you eventually then have time to, to capture additional neutrons on the, on the, on the deuterons. The first, so here I'm showing you from then on, uh, the first, um, what one might call careful or some um, more modern study of the formation of the light elements in the hot Big Bang was by Fermi and Turkevich. 
This was never published because apparently it used cross-sections that at the time were classified because this came from the, uh, these cross-sections were part of the Manhattan Project. Um, but eventually they were declassified. Fermi and Turkevich never wrote it up, but they gave the, the work to Alpha, and so you can find it in a review on, on nuclear synthesis by, by Alpha. So you see that here you have a, a large uh, number of uh, reactions that were included. One of the things that was still done at the time uh, was that the universe assumed to be uh, starting in a state that's all neutrons, and it was pointed out in 49 by Gamow and Hayashi uh, that uh, really there are the, the weak interactions that convert uh, neutrons, I mean, if collisions of neutrons with uh, neutrinos, convert them into protons and electrons and so on. So there, there's really a, a thermal equilibrium between the neutrons and protons, and it's from then on that we have the, the right initial conditions for the, for the modern uh, nuclear synthesis calculations. And so what you have, or what you can write, is the number density of neutrons is uh, exponentially suppressed. So you have this from the, from the neutron decay, and you get something that's, so this is just the mass difference between neutrons and protons, and you can compute this ratio to be 0.16 times the decay factor here, and this is the, what you have until uh, these uh, interactions become efficient uh, enough. And this happens at temperatures of around 10 to the 9 uh, Kelvin. And so you can just uh, plug that in and get a, a helium mass fraction. So this is the uh, 4. It's just because you have 4 nuclei in, in helium. So you compute the mass fraction of helium relative to the total mass fraction. You can easily convert this into, uh, into this formula, and then you just plug in the, the time at which nuclear synthesis uh, happens, so when these processes uh, take over. So these predictions, so uh, at that point you have a fairly uh, modern uh, computation of, of nuclear synthesis, but these predictions were largely uh, forgotten because it became clear that the, the heavy elements couldn't have formed in this way because of the gaps at uh, atomic number 5 and 8. And it also became clear that nuclear synthesis in stars uh, um, could explain the abundance of heavy elements. So this was mostly uh, due to the, to the work of, of Hoyle and collaborators. And so then the idea was, well, if you can form some of the, or if you can form the heavy elements in the, in the stars, maybe you can actually form all the elements in the, in the stars. So some of these things just were forgotten. What makes it somewhat ironic is that at the time there actually was evidence for radiation at a, a few Kelvin from, uh, from measurements by Andrew McKellar from around 1941. And he did give uh, talks about it and there's at least, uh, it's at least documented that he gave a colloquium that Gamow attended and Gamow also uh, apparently requested to talk to him after the colloquium. So it's, it's not clear exactly why this was missed. So it's, it's not clear, in other words, why or what they talked about. Presumably not actually the black body radiation that both groups somehow were talking about. Um, and so then, so as I said, there was a lot of progress by Hoyle and collaborators, and this also started some of the, the modern uh, nuclear synthesis calculations. But he pointed out that nuclear synthesis in the stars can explain the abundances of, of heavy elements, and we know that this is how the heavy elements formed, but it actually cannot explain the abundance of helium. There's too much helium. We wouldn't form all the, the helium in the stars, and this is something that Hoyle uh, pointed out in, in his paper. And so from, from then on it became, uh, was taken more, more seriously, but still not uh, seriously enough maybe. So people didn't put uh, all the, the pieces of evidence together. And it was in, in 1964, Dickey uh, at Princeton asked the question, if you have a, a bounce, could you set up a, a hot uh, universe um, f um, that uh, expanded and that still has enough radiation around or hot uh, radiation 
that we can detect today. So this was uh, rather unrelated to all the, the calculations. So the, the group here really was unaware of the nuclear synthesis calculations. And then uh, Jim Peebles independently worked out the nuclear synthesis calculations again. So he worked on the theory. And then there's uh, Roll and Wilkinson uh, working on their microwave radi uh, radiometer. So here I'm, I'm showing you the, the picture from the top of the uh, uh, building uh, with a radiometer. And at the same time, this is, I think, uh, relatively well known to, to everyone. So there was uh, Penzias and Wilson who had, were looking, I mean, uh, had their antenna and couldn't explain why there was excess uh, antenna temperature. Uh, as everyone knows, I think there were pigeons that they were trying to get rid of and thought maybe the pigeons could be the problem. But eventually became clear once uh, they communicated with the, the Princeton group. So this wasn't in a very direct way, even though it's very close by. So it's just 30 miles away. You can just drive from uh, Princeton to the antenna in, in very little time. Um, but it was in, in very indirect ways. So uh, it, it was, uh, so he, I mean, it was Jim Peoples gave a talk about what they were working on at Princeton. And uh, then Ken Turner, who attended the talk, uh, talked to uh, Bernie Burke, who then talked to Penzias and Wilson, so it was quite, a, quite indirect. And eventually, it was, it was obviously clear to the, to the Princeton group that what Penzias and Wilson had seen was the radiation they had been looking for. And so there were these papers uh, back to back. So there was the, the measurement of the excess antenna temperature by Penzias and Wilson, also famous with the, the modest title. And then the interpretation of this radiation in terms of cosmic black body radiation by Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson. And obviously, as soon as you claim that you've detected cosmic black body radiation, you have to actually show that it's a cosmic black body. So here was only really a measurement at a single frequency. So you want to make measurements at many more frequencies. And what was good to some extent is that this measurement was at a different frequency. It's not too conclusive because uh, you see it's in the new squared part of the, the spectrum. But here are the two data points that one had at the, at the time. So this was the Penzias and Wilson measurement of the radiation at, of around 3 Kelvin and the, the Princeton measurement shortly after that with uh, 3 Kelvin, which uh, confirmed uh, this measurement, but obviously still was short of showing that this was a, a black body. So you really want to uh, get to, to higher frequencies to convince yourself that what you're seeing is a black body spectrum. And the satellite that everyone knows uh, measured this uh, spectrum, this black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation, was proposed in, in 1974. Uh, long uh, time ago, it took uh, a long time to, to build and to fly and to analyze. But this is the, the proposal for, for COBE by uh, these people. And then everyone, I'm sure, has seen the, the beautiful measurement of the black body spectrum by the COBE FIRAS instrument, uh, best black body spectrum uh, that we've measured. So this is the, their measurement. One thing that's often uh, or what that's less known is that around the same time, there were other people actually trying to measure this. In particular, there were attempts by Herb Gosh and his collaborators. Here's a, a paper from 1973 where their measurement didn't work. So they were building uh, detectors and putting them on, on sounding rockets. They had these flights. They tried to detect it. Here they uh, failed to measure something because uh, of contamination uh, by radiation from, from the Earth. There were also some things when you were still seeing exhaust from the rocket and so on. So it's not as clean a measurement as the, the satellite measurement, but people uh, were trying for quite a while, so since the early 70s. And they also succeeded eventually, but just a few months after Kobe measured the black body spectrum. Uh, this is the, the measurement from, uh, from the group around Herb Gosh. So this is Herb Gosh, Mark Halpern, and Ed Wishno. And here you see one of the, the images. So this is another uh, a measurement that's often forgotten, but I, I think deserves more, more credit that it got. So it was just a, a much smaller group of people. And both of them were working on it for, well, 16, 17 uh, years. <laughs> 
Okay, so now let's say a uh, few more words about the, the spectrum. Um, and so why, uh, what makes the, what are the processes that uh, ensure that the, uh, uh, the cosmic microwave background is actually uh, a black body? And here, of course, the, the obvious processes are in the uh, uh, processes where the electrons scatter of photons. So you have uh, Compton scattering or the photon scatter of electrons. Uh, we have a Compton scattering. So here you can exchange uh, energy. Uh, here there's also uh, at higher temperatures, Compton, uh, double Compton scattering is efficient. So you, have, you produce additional uh, photons. And uh, you also can produce additional photons through uh, Bremsstrahlung. So you have processes that exchange energies between the different components. You have processes that allow you to change the number density of photons. So you know that you can bring them into, into thermal equilibrium and you expect uh, a spectrum, at least in the very early universe when all these processes are active, that is the, the black body spectrum. So just the eight pi nu squared d nu over the e to the energy over kt minus one. And the question then is why, uh, or how does it uh, remain a, a black body all the way to the, to the present? So this is something uh, I'll uh, try to discuss in the next, next few slides. So, uh, yeah, so at some point, I mean, it's not completely obvious that if you have a black body at, at early times, that it would be a, a black body at late times just because the radiation eventually will no longer be in, in thermal equilibrium with the matter. So the rate of the interactions goes down and eventually the spectrum might be uh, distorted. So you should ask, uh, do we or why do we? I mean, we know that we do expect a black body because we've already measured it. But to, at, at what level should we expect to, be, to see departures from uh, a black body? And for now, I'll live in an ideal uh, universe where I'm assuming that all the photons last scatter at the same time. So we'll see that that doesn't uh, really matter. Uh, but for now, let's, for simplicity, assume that all photons last scatter at the same time. And let's assume, and these are the things that we'll check and make sure that they're all satisfied, but let's assume that we have a black body spectrum or close to black body spectrum until last scattering. And we'll also ignore processes that inject photons. And then we'll go and get rid of one of these assumptions at a time and we'll see what the expectations are for departures from the black body spectrum. And we'll see that they're uh, very small, but they may be detectable sometime in the, in the future. So the first question is, how, so really, again, imagine we have these, uh, this, uh, hot, these hot photons and they all last scatter at the same time. After that, they're just free streaming. So how does the expansion affect the, uh, affect the spectrum? And here, m maybe I'll uh, briefly write some things on the board, but it's, it's very simple. So you can probably also do it in your head. So the number density of uh, photons that you expect with frequency between nu and nu plus d nu is, uh, so this is at time t. Now the question is, how is it related to the number density at the time when the, the photons last scatter? And obviously a photon that last scattered here had at the time had a higher energy than it does at the, at the later time. So it's just red shifted. So it, uh, well, here it's blue shifted. So there's a of t over A at the time of last scattering, and then also for the same for the frequency interval. So you have A of T over A of T last scattering. And then this is, so th th this number uh, uh, density should be redshifted in addition from the expansion of the universe. So you expect there to be a uh, redshift, uh, redshift factor which I also wrote up there. So there should be uh, redshifted TL over A of T cubed. And then this here, we know what it is. It's the, the black body spectrum because by assumption, we had a black body spectrum until last scattering. So we have AL over A cubed. And then here we have the eight pi uh, 
and then nu squared a of t over a l squared over e to the h nu over k t last scattering, and then here we have the a over a l minus one, and then we have another power from, from here, a of t over a last scattering d nu, and then you see that these all cancel, and this just becomes a pi nu squared over e to the h nu over kt at the, at the time t minus one, where this temperature is just redshifted with respect to the temperature at last scattering by, by one power of the scale factor. So you do preserve the expansion of the universe, preserves the black body uh, spectrum, in other words. This wouldn't be true if you had massive particles, but it's true for any, any massless uh, quanta. You just redshift um, the, the temperature. Now, this, you can easily convince yourself, this is only a function of the energies. So this remains true if you have processes that uh, modify the momenta, so you, you're still allowed to, to scatter, but you're no longer changing the, the energies appreciably. So if you only change the, the momenta, redistribute the, the directions, but no longer change the energies appreciably, this conclusion remains true. So what we'll have to check eventually is that at the time the last scattering occurs, we don't have processes where we change the, the energies dramatically, we only redistribute, but we'll see that this is uh, actually true. So to do this, we'll have to understand when last scattering actually occurs and to understand what the processes are that are active at the time. And then uh, photons will uh, scatter efficiently. This is the same estimate we did before and you've probably seen many times in the workshop. So you always want to estimate the rate of uh, scattering of the photon uh, and ask, is it larger or smaller than, than Hubble? So does it, uh, do they scatter efficiently or not? So they scatter efficiently as long as the, the rate at which a photon scatters is large compared to the expansion rate of the universe. And so if there's uh, no uh, recombination, let's assume for a second that uh, we don't recombine, we just uh, have a, a plasma around at all times, you just estimate this rate, then you would conclude uh, by plugging in the, the number density of electrons, which by charge conservation has to be of order the number density of the, the baryons, which you can write as the energy density in the baryons divided by the mass of the proton, redshifted, so you can plug this in and estimate uh, using what we know about the expansion history of the universe, and you would find that this happens around uh, 100 Kelvin. So now the question is, uh, does this happen or does the universe recombine first? And we know that it does recombine first, but let's uh, see how you estimate this. I saw that you already had that in some other uh, in, uh, uh, lectures. So here this is uh, um, just from uh, thermal equilibrium. You can compute the ratio of the number densities of hydrogen in the 1s state divided by the number density in uh, electrons, number density in protons. And from your uh, statistical physics class, you know this is of this form where B is the, the binding energy of the, of the 1s state. And the uh, universe has to be neutral, so we can set the number densities uh, of electrons equal to the number density of, of protons, at least after the helium recombination. And we can rewrite this equation as in terms of the free electron fraction, and we get the Saha equation. I'm, I'm writing it in this form. Uh, sometimes it's written in a slightly different form uh, we can discuss. But this is the, the Saha equation, which tells you in thermal equilibrium what is the number uh, dense, uh, the free electron fraction as a, as a function of temperature. And you can just plot this. It's very, I mean, you can see that everything about this is known. I mean, you know that this redshifts like one over A cubed. You also know that it's the uh, energy density in baryons divided by the mass of the, the proton. The energy density in baryons, you know, from the measurements we have. So we can just plug in the omega BH squared and so on, the helium mass fraction. You can plug everything in and then just plot this as a function of uh, temperature and see that 
you expect, uh, if, if you were to recombine in thermal equilibrium, this is what you expect. So you expect the universe to, uh, hydrogen to recombine or to form for the first time uh, at a temperature between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin. Now this isn't quite the right way of going about it because it doesn't really happen in thermal equilibrium for a number of reasons. So uh, first, the, um, you uh, emit photons when you, uh, when you combine and the, the photons that you emit in the process, they readily ionize other hydrogen atoms again. Or uh, similarly, if you uh, emit uh, photons in, an, in a transition from a highly excited state to some low-lying state, they will excite other uh, hydrogen atoms. And so they, they don't really escape from the, from the medium and you're not, there's no net uh, recombination. And similarly, the Lyman alpha photons that you have from the 2P to 1S transition also don't escape. They reionize other hydrogen atoms. So this all delays the recombination and eventually the uh, two photon transition from 2S to, two, uh, to 1S actually becomes irrelevant. And these, uh, uh, this simple um, three-level uh, atom that I'm describing here uh, was studied independently by, by Peebles and Seldovich, Kurt and Sonyaev. And the equation that you get if you take these things uh, into account is an equation for the free electron fraction that looks like this. And again, here now you know everything in principle and you can, uh, you can plot it. And you see that indeed if you include all the processes, uh, well, all the processes is too simplistic, so this is what's usually called as Peebles recombination, and this is not usual and not really precise enough anymore for the measurements that are, uh, are done now. So now there's more levels included in the, in the computations, but this is the, the basic picture. So you have a, a delayed recombination because recombination doesn't occur in thermal equilibrium but it still happens at around 3,000 Kelvin, which is much higher than the 100 Kelvin we estimated. So hydrogen, so certainly the um, universe becomes neutral before the, or the, the reason photons no longer effectively scatter of material is not just the, the expansion, but it's the fact that the universe uh, becomes neutral. And uh, what you can do is you can convert this recombination history into a plot of the, the probability when photons last scatter. So there's some uh, probability distribution uh, for the photon to last scatter and you see that it uh, peaks, if you do the calculation, you see it peaks at a, a temperature around 3000 Kelvin. So a typical photon that we see today will uh, last scatter at a temperature of around 3,000 uh, Kelvin. Okay, so at 3,000 Kelvin, as we said, so if you have, uh, the question now is, are there still processes that uh, change the energy? So is it elastic? So you want to understand at this time, uh, do you uh, uh, exchange energy or do you just redistribute the, the momenta? And it turns out, uh, so the, as we said, the, the rate of uh, scattering uh, was given, or the rate of scattering of a uh, photon of, an, of the electrons was N times the, the cross-section uh, times, the, uh, uh, times the, the speed of light, which I kept in, in the slides. And then this is the rate at which they scatter. It's not at the, the rate. The, the typical energies that you're exchanging in these processes are kT squared over m. So you're trying to understand uh, at what rate you're exchanging energies of order kT. And this is suppressed. This is down by one factor of kT over m. So in a typical process, you exchange kT over m squared. Eventually, you would like to exchange energies of order kT for it to make a, an appreciable difference. And so this actually is below the uh, Hubble rate for uh, temperatures below about 10 to the, 10 to the 5 Kelvin. Um, 
that make sense? Okay, so in other words, the Thomson scattering only modifies the spectrum at temperatures above 10 to the 5 Kelvin. At temperatures below 10 to the 5 Kelvin, everything we've said here applies because you're really only changing the, the direction of the photons, but not the energies appreciably. So even though you clearly see that the photons don't all last scatter at the same time, so there's clearly a distribution, there's some probability for them to last scatter at 3,500 degrees, and there's some probability for some of them to last scatter at uh, 2,000 degrees. It doesn't matter because you're, only, you're not changing in the, the scattering that's still going on at the time. You're not changing the, the energies of, uh, of these photons, just the, it's, a, it's elastic scattering. It's uh, Thomson scattering that's going on. So, uh, as I also said, we're ignoring processes that inject photons into the plasma and uh, this is not entirely true, obviously. So, for example, if you have recombination of, of helium, which happens before you have the recombination of the hydrogen, then you have some, some line emission, and uh, these photons if, uh, are injected at, at temperatures low enough, so you don't redistribute the, the energies, as we just discussed. And so there's some uh, spectrum so, uh, of uh, some modification to the black body spectrum, for example, that you expect from uh, recombination lines. This is something that I'm showing here. This is from a, a paper by Jens Chluba, Yassin Ali Haimut, and it's from last year. So this is something, I'll, I'll say a few words about it in, in a second, but this is something uh, that's been very active also because there, there are some hopes that you might see this, either with a future satellite or there's also currently some groups trying to see this uh, from the ground. I mean, just try to measure at some, some frequency where you can try to measure the, the spectral distortions from, from helium recombination. Now, you might ask, why should you care? The reason you might care is that if you can measure it, you have a completely independent measurement of the, the helium uh, abundance in the universe. It's not something that you extract from, uh, from stars. It's a, it's a very clean measurement, so this is one of the things you could do with it. So it's mostly something that uh, confirms the, the, our, our picture, but it's really a, an independent measurement, for example, of the, the helium, uh, helium fraction. Um, now, above 10 to the 5 Kelvin, uh, Kelvin this is uh, in, in the opposite regime now, so you do exchange uh, energy appreciably, um, then uh, this is, uh, and, and if you go to even higher temperatures, at some point you have the double Compton scattering process that I was sketching earlier, uh, it becomes efficient too, or if you go to temperatures below around 6 times 10 to the 6, um, it becomes inefficient. So these were the, uh, the processes where you emit so you have some, some process where you emit an additional photon. So you have your electron. And you emit an additional photon. So this is when you start to also be able to change the, the number density of uh, the number of the, the photons. At temperatures below uh, 10 to the 6, uh, they freeze out. So you no longer have a black body spectrum. You only have a black body spectrum uh, necessarily at, at temperatures above 10 to the 6 Kelvin. At temperatures below 10 to the 6, but above 10 to the 5, uh, what you have is a period where you no longer change the number, uh, dense, number of uh, photons, but you do change their, their energies. So you can generate not the uh, a spectrum, not the black body spectrum, but a spectrum that has uh, something like a chemical potential. So you can have e to the h nu over kt, and then depending on what conventions you use, it's plus or minus mu, and then often the kt is uh, factored into this thing. So you get uh, a spectrum that looks like this with a chemical potential, and this is why it's called the mu era in between. And then after this time, uh, below the 10 to the 5, uh, 
you're also no longer capable of redistributing uh, energies if you inject something into the plasma and you directly see these distortions and this is uh, uh, typically called the, the Y error. So this is when you're generating some Compton uh, Y parameter and then I'm showing you what these various uh, spectral distortions look like. So there's a number of uh, processes that can go on. So the, the silk damping is the uh, most traditional maybe, so this is something that I'll talk about uh, at, some, at some later point in a little bit more detail. So you have a, a plasma of, of baryons and, and photons. At some point, I mean, uh, they're, they're tightly coupled, but as you go to smaller and smaller scales, eventually there's uh, diffusion. So there's uh, photons uh, just diffuse over some length scale. This erases or takes out power from the smallest scales and inject some of the, the energy density from the, uh, from the small scales into the large scales. And this shows up as spectral distortion in the CMB. This is what the, the blue line here is showing. Uh, and then there are some other things. So here are the recombination lines from, from helium that I was already showing. And then in principle, you can also try to probe uh, less uh, departures from our standard uh, Big Bang cosmology from it. You might look for decaying uh, particles that decay uh, at temperatures below, let's say, 10 to the 5 Kelvin. Um, uh, or you have additional contributions, which are, in this case, uh, uh, if you might want to think about it as a foreground, because we can't really model it too well, is from reionization and, and structure formation. But the good thing is that there's uh, information in the spectrum. So you can, to some extent, disentangle uh, the, the various contributions. Um, and here there's some uh, experiments, uh, experimental sensitivities that are somewhat uh, optimistic uh, in this case. I mean, the experiment that's on here isn't really funded. But so the, uh, let's remember, I guess, the, the magnitude here. So these spectral distortions are of order uh, 10 to the minus 20, uh, uh, 25, let's say, just to give you a ballpark. And if you don't remember the, the uh, normalization of the black body spectrum, I'm showing it here again, so you see that the, this is, uh, these distortions are at a, a very low level. So we have fairly good bounds. This is the, the measurement from, I mean, not the measurement, but the theory, but it looks essentially the same as the measurement would. So we have a very good measurement from, from FIRAS. There are some small, uh, the, uh, there are some constraints at the 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 level at departures from spectral distortions. And if we want to see something, we have to go even lower. So we don't really expect the CMB to be a perfect uh, black body, but to very good uh, precision, it should be a black body, and then there's, in principle, departures from it that one can look for, and hopefully, uh, will be able to look for them sometime in the in the near future. So, it, even though these uh, departures are so small, in principle, uh, the hope is that we can actually measure them. So, there's a proposal that is called Pixie. This is a proposal uh, in the U.S. There will be. Um, it will be proposed again uh, in, uh, well, the call should be in, in September, and then it's a call for a mid-ex mission, which is comparable to what uh, WMAP was. It should be proposed by December, and then hopefully sometime next year we would have an idea if something like uh, Pixie would fly. So Pixie, we'll talk more about other experiments, but effectively, so this is a Fourier transform spectrometer. It's the same uh, instrument as FIRAS, essentially, uh, or not, not well, uh, built also by the, by the same people, and you can make it uh, much more sensitive than, than FIRAS just by using today's technology. There's better black bodies than there were at the time. Um, and there was a proposal that wasn't selected that was much more ambitious than, than Pixie. It's, it's PRISM. Um, I don't know what the current status is from spectral distortions in, in Europe. I don't know. Enrico is shaking his, his head. So, I, I mean, this certainly wasn't selected. Uh, there's proposals for uh, additional future satellite missions in Europe. Typically, the time scale for them is uh, relatively late. It's something like 2034, 2035. For Pixie, what's nice is that if it actually is selected, so it was proposed before to be 
uh, uh, completely uh, fair. So the, this was proposed before. It wasn't selected, but it wasn't turned down because somehow the, it was felt that the, the technology wasn't ready. It just lost to, uh, to other fields. And so the hope is that reproposing it now actually it has good chances. If it were selected next year, uh, it should be able to fly by around uh, 2023. And then you wouldn't get down typically to the, uh, to, uh, certainly not to the recombination lines and so on, but it would give you three or four others uh, better constraints than the, uh, the bounds from, from FIRA. So, so far I've only talked about the, the monopole and there's interesting things to do with the monopole. Tomorrow we'll finally look at the, no, yeah, tomorrow we'll finally look at the perturbations, which is where there's been a lot more activity. So here, as you can tell, this is the first experiment to look for these signatures since FIRAS. So it's been a long time. It's been uh, 25 years since they've uh, last been measured. So it would be a, a good time, I think, to, uh, to look at this again. For the perturbations, we'll see there's many more experiments and uh, mu uh, much more activity, but hopefully also uh, this field will eventually um, see some, some activity again. So I'm a little bit early, but maybe if there's questions about any of the things I said, I was probably a bit too slow, uh, too fast. So if you have questions about them, maybe just ask me. And then, yeah? Yeah? Do we have constraints on particles that annihilate or decay during recombination? Yeah, basically. Yes, definitely. Uh, I was trying to show this is something you can uh, look for, for example. So here, one of the lines here was decaying, uh, decaying particles around that time. So this is something that definitely leads to distortions in the, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. In principle, there's also constraints from the annihilation of the cosmic mi uh, of uh, dark matter particles, let's say, or, well, uh, some, some species of particles. Typically, the constraints on those are stronger from the, the uh, angular power spectra rather than from the spectral distortions. But there are definitely constraints on the, uh, on the particles that decay around the time and also particles that annihilate around the time. So definitely there are constraints both from the spectrum and from the perturbations. Yeah? So the idea is that you have some, some functional dependence. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So the question was given that there's a number of processes that could, in principle, introduce spectral distortions. How would you tell which is the, the one you saw? And one of the things uh, I, I briefly mentioned, so certainly the, the mu, uh, mu distortions have a characteristic shape, so it would just correspond to a, a chemical potential. So this is something you can see in a relatively clean way. And then depending a little bit on uh, so there's some uh, set of uh, distortions that people call Y distortions. It's roughly the, the shape that's shown here, but there's, depending on exactly how the process happens, the functional dependence of the distortion on, on frequency varies. I mean, it, it does know about what the underlying process is. And if it's completely Y distortion, then you're just dominated by uh, foregrounds or effects from reionization and, and structure formation. But if it's not wide distortion, if it's something that people call intermediate distortion, then, uh, uh, then in principle, you can distinguish between the, the different processes. So they have characteristic uh, shapes uh, that uh, depend on the, on the process. So in principle, there's some hope to disentangle them just from the frequency dependence. Yeah. 
Ions and muons, so in principle, in the early universe, certainly you have uh, a lot of other particles around. At some point, I was talking about a period where you are roughly below 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So I was always assuming that I'm at temperatures low enough. So 10 to the 10 uh, Kelvin is something like an MeV. So I'm always after uh, nucleus in, uh, in what I'm talking about here, after electrons and positrons annihilate. And so at those low temperatures, you don't really have the, the muons around anymore or the, the pions. But in the early universe, earlier universe, certainly, I mean, if you go to earlier times, you also certainly think that there should have been a, a quark-gluon plasma. So there definitely should have been all these states around. And in principle, also, if you have particles beyond the standard model, if you go to even higher temperatures, they should have been around. So here, I've always been talking about, or for the most part, I've been talking about at relatively low temperatures, below 10 to the 9, where electrons and positrons already annihilated, and you really only have the, uh, the electrons and protons and helium nuclei in the, in the plasma. But at earlier times, certainly, you do have additional particles in the plasma. Yeah. Uh, you said, and uh, people who gave the talk before, you also said that the universe is, from our observations, we see that the universe is almost flat. Yeah. My question is, uh, given that our observations abound by horizon, would it not be proper to say that it's flat inside the horizon that we see, and beyond the horizon, it may, there's a possibility it may not be flat? So I think whenever we, we quote these things, we're only talking about our observable universe. So certainly anything that's further out and that we have no access to, we, we haven't seen anything beyond the last scattering surface, so we, we don't know. I mean, I, I think all the statements we're making typically is about the, the, the universe we observe. So then you might ask in some... Um, bigger theory, can you predict whether patches should be open, closed, if there's some, some landscape of these things, it's something one can, uh, one can think about and how it depends on the model. So certainly in inflation, the idea is that inflation is really a dynamical mechanism that drives you toward a, a flat, uh, a spatially flat universe, and you do have small fluctuations, but at, the, uh, at, a, at a level that you can typically compute uh, to be, let's say, 10 to the minus 4 or something like this. So there are departures from, from the flatness, from just fluctuations. Uh, depending on the model, you can compute them, and then they could be large or small. But the measurements certainly only refer to the part of the universe that we've actually seen. Thank you. So this figure, most of the sources have these two regions. Why, why is that? So this is maybe a little bit misleading. So this is a log plot. As you can see from the units, it doesn't say log here, but it's really a log plot. And so the, the, the distortion looks, if you don't put it on a log plot, if you plot uh, delta i as a function of frequency, uh, that's probably too small, right? Is it OK? So this is the, the spectral uh, distortion, and then as a function of frequency, and it will typically look something like this. So there's a positive part and a negative part, and you're plotting the absolute value here, so that's why it's looking the, the way it is. It is. Okay, if not, uh, we can thank uh, Rafael.